All right, and that lets us know that we're ready to begin. Uh, we're gonna, as soon as we, as soon as we don't interfere with the pictures being taken, would would the lights, would the lights interfere with your pictures if we turn those on, Anne Marie? Would the lights interfere with your pictures if we? You're done. Okay. All right. So we're going to switch the big lights so that the screen is more visible, but we have some light coming from the other side. And that'll take just a moment to warm up. So here we go. All right. Well, welcome back to our study of life together. Uh, just a reminder, we have these books available. I think there's still some over there, as well as in our welcome center. You're not required to get a book. To participate in this class. I'll be teaching it. If you don't want to read along, that's perfectly fine, or don't have the time, I understand. Uh, I'd still encourage you to come because we'll be talking about uh, what we find in here in this class. But um, if you are one who likes to read along, uh, you have the, the book. <clears throat> I've also given you sort of a reading schedule to follow along, depending on which session we're on, uh, and that's in the folder on the left-hand side. Today we're doing introduction part two, so we're still in the introduction, pages seven through 13. And um, uh, last time we talked yeah. about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his life. I think it's absolutely essential to know where he's coming from, his historical context, and what happened in his life uh, to understand what it is that he's emphasizing as important. We also talked about his other famous book that he wrote. He wrote many books, but the other one that's very well known is called The Cost of Discipleship, or sometimes it's just called Discipleship. And I think that's important to know as well, because we talked about cheap grace versus costly grace. And that's an important distinction, because for Bonhoeffer, it was absolutely essential that the Christian life was not sort of this life lived in silos right? That like, okay, I've got my church silo here. I've got my work silo here. I've got my community silo here. And they have nothing to do with one another. No, he was very much uh, a proponent, at, I mean, as is true Christian teaching, uh, that our life is all together. We have our various vocations, yes, but we bring what God has called us to do as Christians to all of them. And so in this book, Life Together, we're going to be talking more today about the importance of our life together. What biblical precedent is there for this exploration in uh, the book? So we've actually, we're actually not going to be touching too much on material found in the book today. Today, we're going to be spending a lot of time, as we should, in God's Word. So uh, before we pray and get started, any questions about anything we've covered so far or as we get started? Any questions? Okay, well, let's go ahead and open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. There is no greater gift than that. We live our lives in light of this gracious and eternal gift each and every day. And while it does involve a life of bearing a cross after our Lord Jesus Christ, we also know that life eternal and resurrection comes as well. And so we thank you for all of this, Lord. We ask that you grant us strength and wisdom, especially as we begin today the study of your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, to get us started here today, I'd like to consider this opening uh, uh, sharing time, and I'll just have you share amongst yourselves at your tables. Share a time when the community you experienced in the Christian church was important to you, and what made it so important at that time in your life. So share a time, if you can think of one, and if you're comfortable sharing, when the community you experienced in the Christian church was important to you, and what made it so important at that time in your life. So we'll uh, take uh, three or four minutes to have that conversation now.
Okay, I'm going to bring it back together here. Hopefully you had some good discussion. What came up in our conversation uh, was, of course, how this Christian community that we have was so impacted in recent years, you know, with COVID and everything like that. But even in the midst of those years, how important community became kind of in new ways and uh, deepened our appreciation and understanding for that. So maybe that's what was included in your conversation. Maybe it was something else, but either way, um, uh, hopefully you had some good time to share there. <clears throat> We're going to start on kind of an interesting topic here. In light of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived through, I'd like to talk about the persecuted church. There's sort of this famous quote, it's attributed to a church father named Tertullian, who's in the second century, so that would have been the, you know, 100s AD. So very shortly after the apostles all lived their lives, you know, uh, John famously lived till 90s, maybe even 100 AD, and so then you have sort of this second and third generation of, of uh, Christians um, who are living in, it's still in Roman persecution, right? The Christian, Christianity doesn't become the religion of the Roman Empire until the 300s. But he says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Has anyone ever heard that quote before? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What do you think he meant by those words? Yeah, Carrie? I think when you see someone's willing to lay down their life for a cause, it makes you stop and pay attention to what they're believing. And I don't think there's a greater witness than to say, this is so important. I'm willing to die for it. And it inspires other people then. Yeah, absolutely. It, it inspires people who may not yet be part of the church to stop and think, wait a minute, they were willing to die for their faith. What does that mean? But I think it also can help encourage and inspire those who are of the of the faith. Any other thoughts on that? Obviously, this was a time of Christian persecution, this time in history. Um, and and so this was not only a hypothetical for Tertullian, this was quite real, uh, quite historical. Um, and so you, you do sort of get this, uh, not only in history, but also in scripture, as Jesus talks about it, and we're going to look at some of that, there's this sort of a, a paradox happening, which is that the more the world, you know, raves against Christianity, it seems like the more it actually assists it in its spread. Now, that tells us a couple things, I think, namely what Carrie was mentioning, that it is an encouragement, it is a testimony, it is a witness. Actually, martyr is a word whose origin, it, the, the word means witness. So to be a martyr means to be a witness. Um, but I also think it sort of tempers our expectations of what it means to follow Christ in this life. Are we following Christ because we think it's going to make our life easier? Or are we following Christ because it's so important and it's so true that it's actually worth sacrificing something for? And so that's what we'll be thinking about here today. I just want to talk about this uh, here for a moment. I actually think uh, Willard, Willard, you follow a group called, is it Gatestone? Gatestone. And it's run by a Jewish woman. However, she tracks primarily... Well, Yeah. Sorry, this was impromptu. Once a month, she gives, uh, well, it, she had, there are several writers, um, but once a month, they give an update on persecution of the Christian church uh, around the world, and uh, it's heartbreaking. Um, so it makes my, <clears throat> I said in the men's uh, Bible study the other week, it makes my problem seem much less. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are thankful. Um, that the Lord does not uh, call us at this moment to be persecuted, although we ought to be ready should that day come. Betsy? And Voice of the Martyrs also. And Voice of the Martyrs, yes, they, they do the same. Now, I think this data might be from Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, I'm not mistaken. And this is kind of hard to um, exactly get right because so much of this happens in dark corners of the world. But all right, so 
for one out of every Christians on the face of this earth, which equates to about 340 million. Okay, so eight times 340 million is how many Christians <laughs> are in the world right now. One out of every eight Christians, about 340 million in the world today, live lives in a, uh, live in a country where they suffer some form of persecution. And that's defined as either arbitrary arrest for their faith, violence for their faith, human rights violations, even death, et cetera. About 11 Christians are killed every day. And in the United States, we are thankful that we largely do not face such persecution, but we shouldn't forget that it is happening around the world still today. In fact, more Christians have been killed in the past 100 years than in any other time in history. What does this fact... So I'm referring to the fact that we don't face the same kind of persecution that is widely happening around the world. What does this fact afford us the ability to do in practicing our faith? The fact that we're not persecuted. Christina? It can let us be complacent and kind of just, yeah, be okay. complacent. Yeah. Okay. So. That's absolutely right. We might become complacent, not realizing uh, the cost that some are actually having to pay for living out their faith. John? Uh, it also gives us the freedom to practice that every day and to share our faith. Okay. So um, I, I think it's a, that's a good balance. So there's sort of a, a, a negative. We, we might grow towards complacency, but if we take time to recognize the positive, we uh, should view it as, hey, we have every opportunity, the opportunity that so many are not afforded to practice our faith, live out our faith, be public with our faith. So this next question, what might we be tempted to take for granted, goes along with what Christina was saying. We might take for granted the fact that we are enabled to practice our faith. Now, I would say in our Christian uh, lives, in our country today, um, we're definitely in a different era than previous eras of our country, even as young as relatively speaking our country is. I wouldn't say that our, Christ, our, our nation was a, should ever be called a Christian nation. It wasn't really established as a Christian nation. Um, however, it was certainly founded on Judeo-Christian uh, ideals. And, and what that really is, is, is just the moral law, right? There was a recognition of there is truth, there is right and wrong, and we, we are basing our, our Constitution and Bill of Rights on such things. Now, there's no doubt about it, the nation was largely Christian, but it's not like our nation was set up to only function well when it is largely Christian. So, right, so you see the distinction I'm making? In other words, we can have a non-Christian government that still recognizes all of our constitutional rights and, you know, the um, per, the first establish the first uh, 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 first amendment. There's the word, uh, and all the rights and abilities we have to practice our faith. <clears throat> that uh, the the government isn't called upon to be Christian. In fact, I think that's a confusion of what the government is there for if we're expecting our government to be Christian. However, it certainly should afford its citizens the right to practice its, its uh, faith. All this to say, we're totally in a different world than you know, even 10 or 20 years, but certainly 50 years ago, where probably most citizens now are not practicing Christians. Uh, you've heard me and Pastor Tom say many times the largest sect of our demographics, the largest religious group growing is the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the non-religiously affiliated. And, um, <clears throat> and so what that means is, as Christians living in this country, we're not facing persecution, like we talked about just a moment ago. We're not by and large, I mean, yeah, it might happen every once in a blue moon, but by and large, we're not being persecuted for our faith. But I would describe it as this. We are certainly losing 
certain privileges that for a long time Christians have had in this society. So we're coming to grips with the fact, well, what does it mean to practice our faith in a culture, in a society that largely doesn't agree with us? We've lost that privileged position. And I would say, actually, maybe that's not all bad, right? Now, it's not good that people are wandering away from the church and not part of the church anymore, but I say it's not all bad because maybe that inspires us to take more seriously our job as the church, that the church should be the church, that we shouldn't be expecting our civil society, our government, to do the work of the church. That's our job. And so it gives us great opportunity to share the gospel and to bring others to the church. So that's just a little bit of a um, comment, I would say, on, on where we are currently in the United States. Any comments about that before we dive into First Peter? Okay, let's open up to First Peter chapter four. First Peter's towards the back of the New Testament. First Peter chapter four, verses 12 through 19. Dear and friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. So be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian for then the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits for those? who have never obeyed God's good news. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Okay, thank you so much. What does Peter say not to do in verse 12? Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at what? At the fiery trial when it comes to test you, right? So we know the difference between temptation and testing, right? God tempts no one. He doesn't tempt us into sin. But God may choose in his wisdom to test us. And testing is different than tempting. Tempting leads to sin. Testing, that is difficulties in our lives, lead us to God. That's the difference. One leads towards sin the other leads towards God. So in testing, we draw closer to God, and he is there, of course, close to us, and we can grow stronger in our faith. But Peter's saying, don't be surprised when this happens. This is to be expected for Christians. Why does he say we can rejoice even in suffering? Verses 13 and 14. Carrie, we participate in Christ's sufferings. That we don't deserve. Okay, so you realize that Christ uh, did not evade suffering, and so when we suffer, we are actually be we are actually being formed, shaped into uh, more to be more like Christ. We know, of course, resurrection and glory comes after the cross but it doesn't mean that Christ evaded the cross, and neither do we. So we may be called to pick up our own cross, as we read last week, but we also know the glory that awaits us, and all on account of Christ, all on account of Christ. What do we need to be careful not to do in suffering? Verse 15. What does it say? 
not suffer because of the wrong things that we've done. Okay. We don't count the consequences of our sin as suffering for Christ. Yeah. Okay. So there is a difference between suffering for just being a bad person or doing stupid things and suffering because you are following God's will, right? The apostle said in the book of Acts, we obey God rather than men when they were told to not talk about Jesus. Well, guess what they decided to do? They talked about Jesus and they were persecuted for it, right? That is godly suffering. If they said, oh, we're going to take as much money from people as we want while we're talking about Jesus and the law comes down on them, well, now they're suffering for their own sinful actions, and that's to be avoided, obviously. So we don't just look to suffering for suffering's sake. We, we, we recognize this is a suffering on account of doing what we are expected to do. What gives us the strength to live like this? Verse 19. Who do we entrust our souls to? God, a faithful God, a faithful creator, the one who made us. And so we know we can trust him. And he holds all things in his hands. Any uh, questions or comments about that? <clears throat> Betsy. Well, just that part about not being surprised. Um, I think that sometimes we persecuted our people over there, as people in other countries, and and why do we feel like we're going to be get off, you know, with, right. without that? One thing is to also just be prepared and to, you know, know that that. Yeah. So I would say, absolutely. First of all, don't be surprised. Don't, you know, we think the norm is, oh, we shouldn't be persecuted, but really the norm is that we should be. <laughs> and it's a wonderful kind of extraordinary blessing that we aren't. Now, that doesn't mean that we go seek to be persecuted. Uh, we are thankful for our government. We're thankful for this country that enables the freedom of expression of faith. And we should voice our support for that. That's a good thing. Um. However, that doesn't mean that it's easy to be a Christian nowadays. And so even though we might not be persecuted, we also shouldn't be uh, ashamed of living out our faith. Uh, we shouldn't be ashamed of picking up our own cross, the ways in which God does call us into difficulty for that living out our faith. So, all right, let's go to Romans chapter five. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Okay, thank you. Some familiar words. <clears throat> Why do we have lasting peace in verse one? Because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, our salvation, our justification is the gift from him, and it's a guaranteed. Absolutely. I liked all the words that you used. It's guaranteed through Jesus. In other words, if it were up to us, we couldn't be certain of it. But because it's not up to us, and it's up to Jesus, and Jesus is perfect, it's a guarantee. So Paul says, <clears throat> because we have this, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But he says in verse three, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. That seems kind of a strange thing to say. But then he gives the reason. What do sufferings produce? Perseverance. 
Perseverance. Okay. Suffering produces perseverance or endurance. It's like you get that image of, you know, training your body in exercise or discipline. You're exercising a muscle. And so the more, you, more it happens, the stronger you get, the more endurance you have. Endurance or perseverance produces what? Character. Okay, so as we are suffering, like we talked about with our last passage from 1 Peter, we are being shaped into the form of Christ. Our character is not being shaped after our old sinful selves. Our character, how we act and who we are, is being shaped by Christ. That is our character. And as it says, that can come from suffering. Character produces what? Hope. So as we are being shaped and formed into the shape of Christ, we are given hope. Now, Paul mentions this. He says, hope does not put us to shame. This is not the kind of hope that the world offers. Like, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or I hope my future will be secure, or I hope that I'll have a good job and a loving family. Like, you don't know if any of those things are going to happen, but you hope. And if it doesn't happen, well, then that hope has put you to shame. You hoped for it, but it didn't happen. But you see, the hope that we have because of Jesus is a different kind of hope. It's a hope that never will put us to shame. Back to the word that Carrie used, because it's a guarantee. And so what are we hoping for? What are we looking forward to? What's that? Salvation eternity, the resurrection. And so through this living in the shape of Christ, we have a hope that we know will never put us to shame because it is a guarantee. And so we are looking forward to it, and that then works backwards to give us everything we need. And that's the next answer. And what do we hope? We hope in the salvation that has been won for us by Jesus Christ. Would someone uh, read uh, Romans 8, 18? Uh, okay. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Okay, and see, that's what we realize. As difficult as our lives might be on this earth, and it is difficult, it doesn't even hold a candle to what's to come. And knowing that, and knowing that that's a hope that will never put us to shame, that gives us strength to endure and to be formed in the shape of Christ. So how does knowing our future hope help us in the present? John? Well, it allows you to live with it very easily. So people asked me the last couple of months, how am I doing with cancer? And I said, I'm doing, doing really good because I know I'm saved. Hmm. And I have that complete assurance so not, I hope it happens, right. but I've said complete assurance. I yeah. don't know if anybody can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not through Zoom, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I tried to turn it into witness opportunity uh, for others, because it really is. And uh, with that complete trust in, in God, uh, allows me to have that complete assurance. So Yeah. And even if God, in his wisdom which we might not understand, decides not to take away your cancer or heal you from it, you know that there will be perfect healing in the day that he raises uh, your, imper your perishable body to be an imperishable body. Yeah. Yeah. In Trish. words, of, he says, it allows us to stand, mm. to stand firm. To stand, to stand firm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It, it puts things in a whole new perspective, in a whole new light. It changes, you know, for those who don't have that kind of hope, think about that. Your present is everything. So if your present is racked by disease or hardship or death, then your hope is gone. But knowing that we have an eternal hope that cannot be touched by the things of this world, that does help us endure. All right, so I'd like to spread these out and kind of read them in, in, in one right after another. Well, 
actually, I'd like to stop and maybe list some of the characteristics. We're going to be looking now, we're going to move from the persecuted church to Christian community. Uh, have you assigned these out yet? I'm actually not sure if I gave anyone Hebrews 10, but the other three, yes. Carrie, I'll get it. Okay, so let's read these, and then let's let's think about some characteristics that we hear as we read these of what Christian community is, okay? So think about what it's saying about Christian community. So Carrie, go ahead. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Great. So what are some descriptions? You can just call them out and I'll repeat them. Um, uh, just some descriptions of Christian community. Meeting together. Spurring one another on, encouraging one another. Yeah, spurring one another on to what? Do good deeds. To do good deeds. It's hard to do the right thing, isn't it? Sometimes we need encouragement. And I think, again, that uh, encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day is drawing near, to remind one another that the day is drawing near. Say, I'm walking with you in your hardship, but remember the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need to hear that all the time. We need to hear that from others, even though we know it. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Who has that? Denise. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, so what do you hear about in there about Christian community? What's that? Care for each other. Care for each other. Bearing one another's burdens. Fulfilling the law of Christ, of course, is all about, what does he say? Love God and love your neighbor. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient to them all. Okay, a few things there. What did you hear in there about what Christian community is about? Helping the weak. Okay, helping the weak. So those who need help, you help. Encourage the faint-hearted kind of goes along with what we were saying with the last passage. When we are in moments of weakness or discouragement, Christian community, other Christians are there to help encourage them. What about that first one? Admonish the idol. St. Paul says, says in many different places, he goes, you all need to be pulling your own weight. <laughs> you need to be busy doing what God has given you to do. And when someone is unable to do what they need to to survive, that's where the Christian church steps in and takes care of them. But if someone is unwilling to work, what does Paul says the, what does Paul say the Christian community does? Call them on it. Yeah, call them on it. Say, look, this is not right. Your neighbor needs your good works. What's that? Uh, the, it begins with the title brothers. And that's brothers and sisters is always by Paul emphasizes the unity we already have in Christ Jesus. We are a community, whether we realize it or not, yeah. because we belong to Christ Jesus. Yeah. You sound like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. <laughs> We're going to talk about that next time. But that's absolutely right. He, he, he doesn't admonish them as strangers. He admonishes them as brothers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then lastly, be patient with all, he says. How hard is it to be patient sometimes? But that's important for community. 
How quickly can community be destroyed or damaged when we aren't patient? We see that in families. We see that in friendships. We see that in the church. And on the highway. What's that? And on the highway. And on the highway, yes. <laughs> very, it's very true. <clears throat> All right, John chapter 13. Who has that? Mark. It's on. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Okay, so not only are we called to love one another, of course, but how will the world know that we are Christians, that we follow Christ? Because of our love. They will see it. And so it is important. <clears throat> any comments or questions about any of that? What's that, Larry? He wrote a song about that. Yeah. Well, there are probably a few songs. Which one are you thinking of? What's Oh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes. All right. Let's go together to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's, her. it's kind of a quintessential Christian community passage here. Verses 12 through 19. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenda. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. <clears throat> For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? Thank you very much. So uh, verse 18, God arranged them. So who arranged the body of Christ? God did. God did. Who, who decided that you would have specific vocations and talents and abilities and a part to play? God did, right? You, you, you actually did not have a choice in that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that's important because to verse 15 if the foot should say because I'm not a hand I do not belong to the body so the foot saying I don't belong to the body what does Paul say that would not make it any less a part of the body the foot saying I don't belong to the body but is it any less a part of the body so actually what you say about you being a part of the body does not count for anything and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, does that make it any less a part of the body? No. Remember, this is God who's deciding what the body of Christ looks like. And then, of course, uh, the importance that there are different parts of the body. We, we aren't all the same. Thanks be to God. So in thinking about this, I'd like you to think, explain in light of this passage why the following sentence doesn't make sense. And I, I kind of coined a phrase that you're just going to hear over and over again in our world today. I am spiritual, but not religious. Have you heard that before? I don't need the church or other Christians in order to practice my faith. I can worship Jesus just fine by myself. So hypothetically, if you ever were to hear that, why doesn't that make sense in light of what we've read in 1 Corinthians? Yeah, Ed? I think of the proverb as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. If I'm only left to my own thoughts, Lord knows where they'll end up. But this, the church body is a, is a community that keeps you from strain on your own thoughts and keeps you uh, theologically sound. Yeah. And, you know, 
keeps you on that straight and narrow, if it were, uh, because all of us will go our own way if left right. to our own devices. Yeah, if we're never checked, we'll come up with all sorts of, you know, the, the, our sinful nature is not short of any heresies. We're very good at coming up with them. And so we need to be checked by others and by God, God's word. Mary Rose? I've heard Pastor Brian Wolf Mueller say that when someone says they're spiritual but not religious, what they're really saying is that they worship a God who doesn't speak. And, uh, and really, they're, they're worshiping a God that agrees with everything that they think in their heads. Isn't that amazing? What a coincidence. No, that's an excellent point, right? We come to church because we hear the word spoken to us through a pastor, yes, but we know it's God's word. Um, and we hear that in the readings, we hear that in the sermon, we hear that in studying the word together. This is a community uh, abiding in God's word. And the person who says, I don't need that, is saying, I can do all that on my own. I'm, I, you know, what I come up with is valid for me. So Carrie was next here, go ahead. I was gonna say kind of on the flip side of that coin, it also, um, you're not doing what Jesus told you to do when you're saying I can do this all on my own because there are going to be times when you can't do it on your own, when you need support and there are other Christians in the community there for you. But then when you're not participating, being one of those supporters for someone else, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, you're denying someone the gifts God's given you that you're supposed to be sharing with them and what you're called to do. Right. That's such an important point. We, you know, when maybe in that opening question, you were thinking about a time when the community was there for you and good praise be to God for that. What about when God calls you to be there for someone else? That's an important flip side. Ed? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So what Ed said, if you didn't hear him, was we come to church, we hear that word, which is both law and gospel. And we are convicted when we hear the law and we need to hear the law. We need to hear how we might not be on the right track. But then we're also delivered the gospel, which is the forgiveness of sins. And if you miss one or the other or both, then where are you? You're just wherever you think you are. Um, and then I think the last thing I just want to highlight once again is someone can say this. Someone can say, I don't need the church. But just like the voices you hear in 1 Corinthians 12, they're, just, they're, they're actually not speaking a truth. If they're truly a Christian, then they are part of the body. And vice versa, if they're part of the body, then they are a Christian. So it's just this dysfunction, this, this incongruity. If someone says, I'm part of the body of Christ, but I'm not part of the body of Christ. It, it doesn't, that it's just, it doesn't make sense. But you see this so often, you see people say this, well, I'm, you know, and, and let me just couch this in saying, especially in recent years, I know there are so many people who physically can't be in church for, for whatever reason, so I'm not talking about them. But for the people who could be here, but choose not to be and are okay with that, there's a disconnect there that's not consistent with what Scripture says, and that needs to be addressed. Uh, G Jesus talks about, so I usually when people say that I don't you know, why do you have to go to church? It's not a have to, it's a want to. Right. And then I say, well, you don't need to go to church. They say you don't need to go to church to believe in Jesus. And I said, that's true. Just like a plant can grow. But if your plants in the basement under the stairs, you got to bring it out in the light and feed it and then right. it'll grow and blossom. Uh, and you'll have many blessings from it. So right. 
Um, if you don't feed your faith in our community, you know, you lose those opportunities as well. Right. Yeah. Hypothetically, someone may be right that I don't need to be in church every week to be a Christian. I mean, I, let's just say hypothetically, that's true. God has graciously, graciously uh, shown where he speaks and where he, um, uh, where he acts on our behalf in church. He's given us the word and sacraments. It's like he's, that's the, that's the source of nourishment that we need, your plant analogy, or our bodies. If you think about, well, how long can you go without eating or nourishing it? Well, you might be able to go a little while, but at, over time, the body does weaken and die. Well, I was just going to say in this, uh, everybody has already kind of said this, but mm -hmm. that encouragement that you get from church um, so that you can go out there and, and live your life among people who don't believe and who have um, strong convictions the opposite way. I mean, that, and, and you see it even in countries where the church is being so persecuted, people yearn, right? to have community yeah um and to hear the and and to be encouraged right so um you know it, it's it's so important to strengthen my convictions and to know how to answer and all of those types of things when i'm faced with you know adversity and yeah. and people are in your face about you know being a christian Right. Um, and it's been like that for quite a while. So coming back here and having the community, it's so encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. And this is sort of the point that this isn't sort of the point. This is the point that Bonhoeffer is going to be making in the first chapter, which is you have a community even when you're by yourself. So be strengthened because the day may come when you will be absent, when you won't see that visible community that we so enjoy but realize that it's still as objective and true for you as in the days when you can visibly see it. And for the persecuted Christian, like you're saying, that is so important that you are never alone. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am also. Right. And even when you are in a jail cell all by yourself, you still have a community of believers because you are connected to Christ. And so it's always a blessing to be with two or three or more other Christians. Okay, so we're going to pause there <clears throat> as we're at time. Uh, we're going to start next week by finishing this up and talking about why are we studying life together. And then we're going to start the first part of chapter one. Let's uh, close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the community you have made us a part of through your son, Jesus Christ. We know we didn't do anything to deserve or earn the, our spot here but you give it to us graciously. And there are so many benefits to be here. Help us to be thankful for that and realize that each day. And as we go out into the world, knowing your great love for us, may the world know that we are Christians by our love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.